The Bank of Canada governor has allowed himself to become the ATM machine of this government. And so I would replace him. If you're an investor looking at coming to Canada and you hear that kind of a statement coming from a member of the House of Commons, you'd think you're in a third world country. I disagree with Mr. Polyev's approach that you can opt out of inflation with cryptocurrency. Um, magic internet money fluctuates vastly. Mr. Polyver is promoting a decentralized currency over his own government's currency. That is a problem. We should behave like conservatives again and not tell people what they should and should invest in. Just some of the heated exchanges from last night's conservative leadership debate. That part, anyway, focused on inflation, the Bank of Canada, and cryptocurrencies. So what were some of the takeaways from those moments and the debate overall? It's Thursday. I'm here with that issue. Chantelle Bear, Andrew Coyne, Althea Raj, and Elamine abdul Mahmoud. Good to see everybody. Uh, I'm going to start with you, Andrew, because you had, had written, hopefully, that this debate would be different than the one <laughs> a week ago. Uh, I wonder whether uh, you, you felt... Um, that you got what you wanted out of that debate last night. <laughs> yeah, when you say hopefully, <laughs> it was said without much hope. Uh, no, it was a depressing spectacle all around. Uh, you had the format of the debate was terrible. There were too many gimmicks like the orange paddles and the sad trombones. Uh, the rules were too prescriptive. The moderator was too intrusive. And then the whole thing gave them very little opportunity to actually talk sensibly or seriously about the issues that are actually confronted us. Instead, we got a lot of stuff about what was their favorite book, et cetera. Uh, on top of which, you've got a singularly unimpressive field that seems to grow smaller in its impressiveness as time goes on. Um, and who are, half of them at any rate, seem obsessed with fringe issues uh, like uh, vaccine mandates or... Uh, you know, uh, Bitcoin or yeah. is the World Economic Forum running all of our lives? So it, this is not a particularly uh, uh, um, energizing or impressive race so far. Chantal? Format. I mean, who knew that you could use uh, some musical instrument to stop people in a partisan setting from mentioning <laughs> their main rival, the prime minister? Uh, it has to be something new. Uh, that no one has ever thought of. As for content, I agree. We do this. You try to keep us on time. None of us can articulate a comprehensive policy in 15 or 30 seconds. So not to make a choice between any of these people, they were asked to do that for two hours. Yeah. And I'm guessing the people who are most shortchanged have to be, if they care, conservative members because they really got shortchanged uh, last night. Althea? Well, we don't, you know, practice our answers uh, with our teams for hours to make sure that we can fit what we want to say in 30 seconds. You might seconds. practice in the mirror, Althea. You might practice in the mirror. <laughs> I, yeah. I, I probably should, but unfortunately I don't. Um, <laughs> Yes, the format was interesting. It was more like a game show than a debate. Um, the whole idea of like uh, putting your paddle up so that you could interject when you wanted to, but then you wouldn't have any interjections left, which is what happened to Pierre Poilievre. Yeah. Uh, he was like mute for about 20 minutes uh, in the later half of that debate, um, was really unfortunate. And there wasn't a lot of time for open debate, a substantial open debate. And only when we did have that open exchange between um, the candidates, were we able to pull out some compare and contrast between mm -hmm. the candidates? And that's, I think, really what the membership is looking for. Yeah. And for many members, what they're hoping Canadians are looking for, too, because so many of us have as their path to victory, um, trying to get, you know, the non-conservative base to vote for them. Uh, to me, I, I felt that Patrick Brown did did very well. And perhaps that's because, uh, you know, w we hadn't seen him uh, in the um, Manning Center debate. Mm -hmm. I thought Roman Baber did really well as well. Um, we heard more from him than we had heard uh, in the previous debate. And he also, I think, expressed nuance in areas where you don't normally hear conservatives. For example, talking about um, what one would, or how one would treat um, offenders that have mental health challenges. Yep. You know, so there were areas around the edges where we heard conservatives talk about the candidates talk about issues that were not Bitcoin and were not about the convoy, but they were dominated by, by the convoy and they were dominated against attacks against Pierre Polyev. Yeah, Elamine. 
I mean, I'm not sure that I minded, uh, you know, what your favorite book stuff that much because, you know, <laughs> for many of those candidates on stage, uh, people are not, are, not, are not familiar with them. They are unknown quantities. So it's nice to hear that some candidates prefer Amy Winehouse. Having said that, uh, when you sort of get into the area of differentiation, there, you know, there were really like the three sort of big areas. Um, because like when you get to, for example, um, the, uh, there was broad agreement on oil and gas development in this country. There was broad agreement on immigration. It was nice to see that immigration is sort of agreed upon from all the candidates. Um, but then we yeah. get into issues like um, Leslie Lewis being the only candidate on stage who's explicitly saying that she's someone who's pro-life. Um, that I thought that was like a really interesting moment that I think will change the course of the debate because it will force the other candidates to come up with a sort of clearer answer. Um, and I think like we're we're basically just getting started on this. Uh, Chantal. Well, we are or we are not. This is the last English language debate until mm. uh, the recruitment of members is over, and the French language debate will feature two candidates, Pierre Poilievre and Jean Charest, who can actually debate in French, and others who will struggle. So yeah. that's it. Mm. Uh, and I also believe that if you're a normal person, not someone who lives in another galaxy, and you're looking for answers uh, on the economic front, you heard more voodoo economics from the front runner than you heard solutions to your daily problems. That works well in an audience that wants to vote for you. Uh, of party members, yeah. whether that connection to the larger stage, the electorate worked, I would argue did not. Yeah, I mean, that part of that was because, as Althea said, uh, Pierre Poilievre got sort of shut out for, for portions of the debate at, at the end because he had used all of his opportunities. But, Andrew, let's go back to that a little bit more. The, some of those suggestions by, by Poilievre, whether getting rid of the governor of the Bank of Canada or, like, a lot of conversation around cryptocurrency, I think more than most Canadians would have wanted. Well, yeah, I mean, he hitched his wagon uh, to Bitcoin uh, early in this campaign when everybody it looked like was getting rich off of it. So now the, the Bitcoin and other uh, digital currencies are plummeting. Uh, and he, naturally, he'd prefer not to be talking about that anymore. But remember, that was part of a broader campaign to delegitimize and demonize the Bank of Canada. So he was literally saying people should be able to opt out of uh, the dollar into these uh, non-inflationary currencies that, oh, by the way, just lost 50% of their value over the last six months. Uh, this, the, the, well, he's taking it further now, of course, by literally saying he would fire the Bank of Canada governor, which I raised as a possibility as a sort of a joke a week or two ago, uh, but which he seems to have taken to heart. Um, this, he has no, let's be clear, he has no actual serious policy difference with the Bank of Canada. You know, Paul would like would like low inflation, so would the bank. He has no coherent critique of their past record. He can't actually say what they should have done differently. Should they not have bought all this bonds? Should the, should the government, should the government yeah. just have had, had to raise all that money on private markets with the deflation that was, that was present in the economy at that time? So he doesn't really have a current, current critique. He just wants a whipping boy. He wants somebody he can mm -hmm. attack to rile up the masses. Partly it's because he wants to attack institutions in general and yes. expertise yes. in general, which is a playbook we've seen from populists before. Yes. Uh, but the potential for crisis in this, if he ever got near power, because is great because financial markets, frankly, wouldn't be getting into the nuances of whatever minor differences of opinion he had with the Bank of Canada governor. All they'd be seeing was basically the bank is being politicized and its independence compromised. Yeah. Uh, and, and we would all pay the price for that. And, but that is what it's about, and our, our, our colleague Aaron Wary wrote about that today, that it is uh, an anti-institution stance that Poilievre has taken here, Althea. Yes, very much so. Um, I also think, you know, it sounds crazy when you, when you hear him say he would replace the governor of the Bank of Canada, but it is like the government can pick who the governor sure. of the Bank sure. of Canada is. Sure. And when their term is up, yeah. they often pick a new governor of the Bank of Canada. Um, so uh, to me, I thought what was striking was what we saw yesterday was Pierre Poilier was, has very hot and bombastic rhetoric. But when you actually look at what he's saying, like on those yes or no questions, he was the only candidate on stage really vocalizing incrementalism. He said he was uh, opposed to uh, uh, an air cover in Ukraine. He said he was opposed to the 2% of yeah. GDP, the NATO commitment, that he would work towards it. Um, you know, he took stance as somebody who may be uh, 
pegged by his answers in a future election campaign. Yeah. And so he demonstrated, I think, great restraint, um, interestingly enough, on, on many other questions that were posed to him. Elamine? I think it's extraordinary to call uh, Pierre Polyev someone who was restrained um, on that stage. I mean, like, the, the, the big headlines is that everybody's talking about specifically are the Bank of Canada quote. And I think the, the way that he's positioning himself, um, he's positioning that particular stance um, as a criticism of Trudeau and a criticism of the Bank of Canada's decision to allow Trudeau um, to, to run up large deficits. The idea, um, like, of course, like we know well enough that the independence of Bank of Canada is really important in this country. However, it it works, right? It works because this is not a, intended for a broader audience of all Canadians. It is intended for the conservative base, who is frustrated by inflation, and they. And so he's sort of targeting that sure. statement towards there. Sure. I wonder what consequences that will have uh, later in the future, because that is, a, I would say, quite a radical stance. Uh, Twenty seconds, Chantal. It also increases the gap uh, between uh, leading candidates in this campaign. And that, if you're going to have to be the leader of the opposition for three years, which yeah. might happen, uh, could blow up your party. Are you, yes or no, going to be a national conservative alternative and party? That's our challenge, ladies and gentlemen. When we unite the party along that consistent principle of freedom, then we bring all the various parts of our party together. It's not enough just to unite conservatives. We need to win over swing voters, people who don't aren't part of our party. So did last night's debate help unite conservatives inside the party and, as one candidate said there, convince Canadians outside? Althea, what, what do you make of that? Was there enough there that would be appealing both to the, the base, the people that care the most about the party, and to Canadians who may have been watching? Well, I would probably argue that Charest and Brown and Aitchinson would like people <laughs> who are not members of the party to be watching so they could uh, go out and buy membership cards and um, help uh, them win this campaign because their whole game plan is to attract people who are not currently members and to attract, frankly, those swing, you know, liberal, conservative swing uh, voters, mostly liberals, though uh, some new Democrats as well. To me, I... I'd say the real takeaway, like the question that kind of wraps everything up, is an interjection that Jean Charest said with regards to the Bitcoin stuff uh, against Pierre Poiliev. He, he talked about how, um, and you, you played that clip at the very beginning, about how anybody looking at an MP talking about removing the Bank of Canada governor would be seen like a third world country. And then he talked about how that was undermining institutions. And he said, conservatives don't do that. Mm -hmm. Like mm -hmm. what's really, I think, at stake in this contest is who is this conservative? Has the party yeah. moved uh, towards a more yeah. a populist party that Jean Charest no longer can speak to? Like, are, are, whose notions of what yeah. is a conservatives yeah. are really at play here? Yeah. And the other thing that he said during I think that, that was on display. Yeah, the other thing he said during the, that debate, Jean Charest, was that he was not a conservative hyphenate. And, and I talked to conservatives on this program last night who felt the same way, that hyphenating who you are as a conservative takes away from the pitch, Elamine. Uh, I think there's something really notable about the way that uh, whatever, I think if, if you are not a conservative and you were watching that debate, um, you, the, the impressionistic idea that you come away from the conservative party is quite a bit of disarray. Um, I think if, whether we're talking about the Bitcoin stuff, which I think is like that kind of stuff tends to stick in the air, um, the, the Bank of Canada stuff, um, the idea that there is still a conservative um, candidate um, who wants to lead the party, who is pro-life in this country. Um, she did say that she would not sort of move um, to, 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 to change the laws in this country. But I think that's still worthwhile in terms of saying, if you are not a conservative member, then you yeah. kind of walk away from that debate with an impressionistic idea of where this party is. And I'm not sure that that is doing the party any service right now. Chantal? Um, the answer to your question is no. I don't think that people who watched uh, last night felt uh, this is a party that is speaking to me. It felt more like these are people in a parallel universe. Uh, I believe Pierre Poiliev is at this point, and this is almost the last debate, which is probably good for the party, damaging the economic and fiscal brand of the Conservative Party, which is its main card. And um, I've 
spoken to more conservatives who were depressed today than conservatives who were happy. That <laughs> is not a sign of an expanding camping ground with having yeah. Christmas in July. I've, had, I've spoken <laughs> to conservatives who were very meh. That's how I would describe where they were today, Andrew. <laughs> Uh, there's two issues, two broad issues in any leadership campaign, certainly in a conservative leadership campaign. One is winnability, the other is identity. Uh, so Pierre Poilievre does very well at the identity side of making conservatives feel good about being conservative. He's done next to nothing to increase his saleability of the public at large and to make that winnability case. And in fact, every time he opens his mouth, he, I think, raises new questions about his judgment, about his the ex extremity, the recklessness, etc. I, I don't see anybody yet capitalizing on that. I think Jean Charest, I'm not sure the message of national unity is really a big winner for him. I think he has to do two things. He has to remind people of Polyarev's poor judgment, but he has to also make the case, not just that he's an unhyphenated conservative, but that he's a conservative. And there's an old saying, you know, show, don't tell. It's not about talking about what he did when he was premier. He needs to have much more concrete uh, series of policies that say he's a modern conservative, he's, on, he's in touch with the issues of the day, and he's in touch with his party. Uh, and I don't think he's done nearly enough of that to, to make the case that people can then switch from Chere, from Poyavri if they're worried about his electability and still feel like, okay, we really do have a genuine conservative as our leader. Okay, we're going to leave it there. Thank you. That was a great discussion. I appreciate it, everybody.